May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. your host of The Big Show. May the best brand win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. I'm just uh, I'm a man that's counting down the minutes before I see Avengers Endgame tonight. And uh, with me in the booth, uh, that incredibly awkward start of the show, uh, is our intern, Hans. Hans, you, you out there, man. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I completely apologize. <laughs> Dude, man, that was crazy. So it's like uh, I couldn't hear anything going on. So yeah. I, anyway, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No worries. Now we're so anyway. We're we're back. We're we're back for another fun week of the show. Uh, you know, you guys have tuned into a good one. Um, it's uh episode 121 of the program, and um, I call this one tone. You know, it's not only what we say, but exactly how we say it that uh, deepens our marketing relationships and the tone that a brand uses to communicate can be a really important choice. Um, You know, both at the beginning and really throughout the entire, uh, you know, company's life. So it's, um, it's just, it's a really important thing. It doesn't, we don't always get a chance to, to, uh, to delve into it. Uh, You know, so many approaches today are completely tone deaf, you know, or they, and they, and they lack any real sense of tone. And that's a real missed opportunity. Uh, that can be really one of you know very powerful part of branding is is talking about tone. So uh, you know so many uh, you know today we're gonna we're gonna dig into this. We're gonna talk about um, what's going on with brand tone. We're gonna talk about who's doing it right. Give you a couple examples. Uh, one example this week that I got that was really really wrong and bad. And uh, of course we're also gonna dig into um, you know who, a whole bunch of who, winning and losing this week and. Um, I'm going to say it right now. I think this is going to be a Nobel Peace Prize winning episode of the show. You guys tuned into a, a historic episode. Honestly, it's going to be fantastic. So let's dig into tone before we. So tone, tone, tone. Um, there's a lot of parallels in marketing and and the music business. And um, you know, guitars have tone. Marketing has tone, right? Uh, and just a couple of parallels that I can draw there, especially for you music industry folks out there. Is it and and musicians out there? Is the fact that, you know, if you want to start a fight between guitar players, you start talking about which famous guitar player had the best tone, and you will have you will have people uh, going at each other's throats for reasons that even they can't really define what they're talking about. No, Eddie Van Halen had the greatest tone. No, it was Hendrix. No, it you know it was Jimmy Page. It was it was oh, and then and they'll start to describe the um, the various aspects of the of the tone. There have been numerous, you know, articles, books, you know, volumes written about, about tone in music. And, uh, so tone's really important, you know, not just the notes that you play, but the tone that comes out of your instrument, um, really can kind of sort of define your sound. And it's true that folks like Hendrix and Van Halen, um, you know, and Page and, 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 uh, you know, you know, folks like that, have these defining tones. When you hear Eddie Van Halen's guitar, you know it's Eddie Van Halen's guitar. You know it because of the tone, right? And if you and if musicians, you know, are, are if, if your musicians are talking to each other, they can say they can start to describe what that sounds like and what what that is and exactly musically kind of what that tone is. Um, now in marketing, we have this really we have a lot of the same stuff. We we have uh, it's really really important the tone that we use. Now, copywriters know this and are, are extremely well-versed in this, but um, not everybody who works in branding really has a good grasp of tone, I notice. I notice it because there's a lot of awful marketing that comes my way from various companies, and um, they have no idea what tone they're they're communicating in, you know, or even how to, how to leverage that or use it. So I thought it would be important to kind of just talk about a few tone types there are lots, by the way. It's as much, it's unique as a person's personality. But some that you kind of see on blogs and, and various communications out there is kind of the informative and kind of funny tone, right? You see that. Uh, I, I use some, that, uh, that tone sometimes in a lot, of, a lot of business blogs that I write for people because, um, you know, it's a cool tone. Uh, 
and informative is usually where you're where you're going, right? That's what you're trying to do. Um, and some of your luxury brands, you kind of get this tone that you know you're probably not good enough to buy whatever we're selling, and and we're kind of above you tone. There's a there's kind of a snotty uh, snobbery tone, uh, luxury. Some people will put that into the kind, you know, euphemistic language of, of being, uh, you know, aspirational marketing kind of kind of tone. But really, I call that uh, you're probably not good enough for this tone. There's a cool and casual tone, which is where you have broken English in sentences. You, you're you just kind of cool. You're just kind of writing as you talk, and you just, you just uh, you know, try it, you know, the tone is trying to be cool. There's a, there's, you can have an, a vulnerable or an emotional tone. You can have, uh, you know, a friendly or happy tone. Um, you know, I mean, some of some of the descriptors you could have, you can have, you know, uh, an authoritative tone, a, um, uh, you know, caring tone, casual, dry, edgy, friendly, frank, funny, humorous, uh, ir- irreverent, uh, quirky, romantic, sarcastic, you know, flirty, snarky, sympathetic, trendy, um, you know, witty. You can have, um, you know, all those kind of things can be written into your tone. And um, and it's really important that that you sort of understand that that doesn't happen by accident, right? That doesn't, you don't just, you, uh, you don't just stumble into tone. It's a decision. It's a decision. It's an important strategic marketing decision if you say, this is our brand, and we will we need to communicate using this sort of tone. We if we're going to be snarky, great. Let's own snarky. Let's figure out how we're going to be that. You know, how we're going to be that with the brand. But where you start to get into trouble and some brands do it really really well. Um, you know, for example, Wendy's um social media has a real kind of a a snarky edgy tone and they and they win a lot of kudos for being so good on social media and having kind of that edge, right? And being able to, you know, c- come at it with with that strong edge. But um you have to watch it too because um sometimes your your awesome snarky tone, you know, can really backfire on you and you end up, you know, saying something offensive and then you end up deleting tweets and you end up doing all the stuff that we talk about on this show that is sort of bad in the social media space. So, you don't you certainly don't want to do that. Um I'll give you an example of tone that I think uh, is kind of important. So I got an email this week um, from I'm a member of uh, Farmer Boys, um, you know the uh, the fast food chain uh, here in Southern California. I'm a member of their VIP club, and they sent me an email that says, uh, and the the title of the email is "What happened?" with a question mark. And I'm like, "What happened?" You know, so so I did open it, and it says, "Come in for a free side now." And then it shows this kind of sad scare, scarecrow image, and it says, "Or see a grown scarecrow cry. He misses you. We miss you. Come in now and get your choice of fries: four piece zucchini, four piece onion rings, fresh fruit, or a side salad for free. Free scarecrow hugs included." Uh, so. I don't, this is this is a ba- this is bad tone to me, because it's like, what relationship do you feel like we have? You are a restaurant, and I am in your VIP club. Do not imagine that we have a greater emotional attachment than that. Me stopping in to get a four piece zucchini is going to be the extent of our emotional engagement. Learn it, understand what role do you occupy in the customer's life. And don't send me emails that say, what happened? I mean, you know, what happened was, I don't know. I wasn't around. I mean, I, I, suddenly I start feeling guilty that maybe I haven't spent enough time with them and, and, and eaten enough, you know, side orders, free side orders uh, of these kind of things. Guilt and neediness and things like that do not position your brand for success. Because think about it. Let's, we always use marketing and romantic relationships back and forth, Right. In a romantic relationship, if you get an email from your significant other, it says, or from or you're dating somebody, and they say, you, after a couple of times, they say, "What happened? What happened? Everything was going along fine." And there's a, you know, the hum, the human interaction for of, for getting that sort of communication back to you is avoidance. You're going to, you know, you, your go to is going to be to avoid, or to because it's an uncomfortable situation. It's it's weirdly guilty. It's 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 weird. 
it's weird and it's needy and it's all the things that you don't want in a partner and it's all the things that you don't want in a brand. And if you were the brand manager for Farmer Boys, it is damn sure what you do not want to be putting out for your brand, right? Um, and, and, and Farmer Boys, uh, I've just never noticed that tone before, right? This is why you have to watch tone because, you know, yeah, maybe – and, and I think sometimes digital marketing automation could be at fault for some of this stupidity because they they program in messages that correspond with your behavior. Oh, I'm on a customer that hasn't visited them in 90 days. They're going to send me the what happened. Let's try to get you back kind of thing. The problema is the fact that you don't know why I haven't been there, right? You can't make an assumption and don't make an assumption that it was you know something that you did or we have to have some kind of weirdly awkward human-like exchange about why I haven't eaten at your stupid fast food restaurant. You know, I mean, the, the reason that I haven't eaten there is probably I just haven't been by there. I, I mean, I don't know when I, when I start to think about the reasons why I didn't go there, I'm like, I just wasn't around where your location was when I had to eat. Uh, it wasn't that wildly important to me to go out of my way to do that. Uh, I don't spend a, a ridiculous amount of time thinking about where I am going to eat and thus, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just, I mean, you, you see what I mean? The relationship, it's like I owe them an explanation as to why. Maybe I'm trying to lose weight. I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm trying. Maybe there's a million reasons why I'm not. Maybe your prices are too high. Maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know. But when you send people tone-deaf messages that say, what happened? What happened? Was it us? You know, I feel like I want to bounce back and say, it's not you, it's me. You know, and, and it's like, it's... It's odd. It's odd. It's an odd exchange between us. It, the whole thing made me feel weird. Um, it made, and I'll tell you what, just from a marketing perspective, it made me feel like not going in there again. They're tracking my data of when I go in there, and they've got me on some kind of cycle that sends me the needy email ninety days after I haven't been there. If I haven't been there in ninety days, don't send the needy email. Be stronger than that, right? And you digital marketers out there, this is where you have to use your actual marketing sense right? This is where that conversion, that funnel stupid crap that you guys do really bites you in the butt. Because when a human being receives your email, they react as if the brand is talking to them. And if it's, and they will react negatively if you are overly weird about your tone, which is kind of why we're talking about this today, right? Um, uh, you know, one of the interesting things I saw, and, and tone doesn't just have to be words, too. You know, um, your images are, can be uh, can actually communicate tone as well. For example, I saw a story this week that said that Instagram um, Instagrammers out there, the influencers of the world, no longer really care that much about um, uh, having perfect photos. You know, these perfect Instagram, like, you know, filters and photos where they show like avocado toast at the beach and, and stuff like this. And it's like, it's like this perfect uh, f- photo. And there's really a movement inside the Instagram, you know, area to kind of do things in a more real capacity because they feel like uh, people don't want to see all of your stage stuff anymore. And they, they're looking for something real on Instagram, which is kind of funny. It's kind of an oxymoron when you think about it, something real on Instagram. That's funny. So, uh, but that's kind of what the influencers are, are communicating. And that's why they're, um, you know, doing things with, you know, just regular, regular lighting and, and, um, and, you know, uh, not cr- trying to create the perfect picture, but instead doing something like that. That's a tone decision, right? You've made the decision on that. You've made the, dis- a, to- a tonality decision to say, we're going to be, we're, we're going to be real. Right. So our words, you know, how we say things is going to be straightforward. We're going to be, you know, try to be more, you know, quote unquote real. And um, and we're going to try to have imagery that is more, quote unquote, real as well. That is um, that is kind of fascinating. Right. And and like I said, it it has to do with a lot of things that, um, you know, you know, tone can stretch, you know, images can can communicate tone as well. And and this, if I see one mistake, you know that that brand that folks that are in, in marketing make is that they kind of do that. Well, that's not my job, not my prob kind of thing, and and they assign that to someone to someone else. You know, uh, oh, the art director is going to take care of that, right? So the director of marketing doesn't need to, uh, you know, make sure that the image is is right for the tone. Wrong answer. You know, if you are in the brand police chair, 
get ready for the fun part of the job, which is that everything counts, right? We talk about that rule in, there, in branding. We talk about everything counts a lot, right? Well, that means images and that means words. And that means you can be doing it right for, you know, hundreds of emails with farmer boys and you send the customers out a single what happened sad scarecrow email and we're all scratching our heads going do i leave this vip program now i mean do i need to break up with these people i mean you know what where where are we you know that kind of thing marketing is about building relationships it is about the next thing that you do is designed to build the relationship you know better stronger that kind of thing whenever your uh desire to communicate drives the relationship in a negative direction, that is a failure. That is an absolute failure on behalf of marketing. And you have to be careful. What do we always talk about on the show? That communications, you know, has an edge that can cut you as much as it can cut through. So make sure that you understand that when you make when you're sitting in the marketing meeting and they say, "Oh well, uh, according to the marketing automation software, Scott Robertson hasn't visited the uh, Farmer Boys restaurant in 90 days, so let's go ahead and send him the uh, what happened email." And they don't consider the fact that is this guy going to be completely weirded out when he gets a what happened email from a freaking fast food restaurant? You know, it's like you know, like I said, I I don't know how to respond to it. Uh, to, to be quite honest, it, it's a little creepy. It makes me want to avoid going there. It makes me want to drop the VIP membership and avoid going there. And like I said, if that is the outcome of your communications, then your communications sucks. And you need to seriously look at what you're doing. And not enough marketers in this world look at what they're doing, what they're inflicting out there, because they're so concerned with looking at the marketing automation funnel that they forgot how to communicate and they forgot how to use tone. We're talking about tone all day today here on Made the Best Brand Win uh, on Intertalk Radio. Come on back. We're going to talk about a a whole crop of who's winning and losing this week. Come on back. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, happy Friday, everybody. You are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader in Music Biz Talk. I am Scott, your host. 
a man. We're talking about tone. We got Hans Gruber in the uh, in the studio with us, running the ones and twos today. How's it going, Hans? Pretty good. Just good week. Lot. Yeah, it's been a good week. We had a yeah. We just came off of another show that was a, a surprise for me. So yeah. nice. So that's fun. Having a good time. You got to roll with the punches, or as Ario Speedwagon once said, "You got to roll with the changes." It's important. Sounds like you know that song. Listen. Do you know that song, Hans? Do you know the "Roll with the Changes" song? I don't know that song though. Have you ever heard Ario Speedwagon before? No, I have not. All right, that's your homework. You need to go and check. That's one of their better songs. You got to check out "Roll with the Changes" by Ario Speedwagon. It's a rocking song. It's a. I tell you what. So it's a super rocking song for and and most people with Ario. If I said the words "rock" and "song," they're known for a lot of ballads and stuff. I mean, you wouldn't even believe that that is going to happen. But uh, that song in particular just rocks. Absolutely rocks. You got to listen to that, okay? Got to check it out, yeah. All right, cool. Let's get into who's winning and losing this week. Uh, All right. Oh, man, we got to talk about the Samsung Galaxy Fold. Good Lord. So uh, the Galaxy Fold sent out some review units to a bunch of reporters like at Engadget and, and, um, you know, Gizmodo and, and, um, you know, New Atlas and those kind of things. And just about every single one of them broke. So uh, they folded it over and display broke the screen after a day of use. Uh, they sent it to CNBC and um, uh, they said the display had started flickering. Bloomberg, um, that's which is an odd review, by the way. Just from a PR perspective, you send it to Bloomberg? Bloomberg's not going to look at your stuff. I mean, I'm sorry. But uh, anyway, uh, dis- display is busted, though he noted he took off the layer of protected film, which Samsung said shouldn't be removed. See? Users, man. What are you going to say? My goodness. So the folding screen they've touted is going to be fantastic, right? You fold. You have a wider, like, tablet. You can fold that bad boy over into a, um, like, phone size kind of thing. It's like a, it's like two thousand dollars for this this thing, and um, right right now they said that you can't buy the Galaxy Fold due to overwhelming demand, and people have been placed on a wait list. But apparently, all the units that are out there right now, especially to these these journalists, are uh, breaking, and so that is a uh, that is losing. That is the dictionary definition of losing right there. Um, Samsung, what are you doing? I mean, you know. If it's not a battery that's heating up and blowing up and we get to watch somebody's, you know, Jeep catch on fire and burn down a house and, and those kind of things because your phones or we don't have a Homeland Security asking all the people in line, uh, if you have a Samsung phone, you have to get out of line because you, your phone sucks. You know, I mean, if it's not that, then the next review unit you send out, in, in, you know, trying to do these fold, fold things and they are broken as well, right? So, you know, you need better PR representation, Samsung. You need a public relations firm that will sit in the room with you and go, does our crap work? Uh, you know, and, and, and give me the honest truth. And if the answer comes back with anything else other than a resounding yes, then somebody needs to say, well, let's hold off on launching this and let's hold off on putting this in the hands of the journalists because if it breaks and they write about it all over the place, then it will be literally the opposite of good PR. You know, it will be terrible for the brand and terrible for us and ter- and and terrible in so many ways. So let's just not do that. That's how you uh, not have that happen, by the way, is you just don't send those things out and you make sure your stuff works before you do send it out. Sounds easy, but there you go. Samsung losing. You know who's winning? The movie I'm going to see tonight, Avengers Endgame, brings in a record $60 million on its opening like preview night. You know, it's like it's, it's preview with just a few showings last night made $60 million. That is all kinds of a record. That is huge. Amazing. And if you want to see something really cool, go to Google today, you type in Thanos and then you click on the little gauntlet at the right hand side of it. And it will automatically res- um, erase half of your search results <laughs> in this really cool animations, it, you know, so really, really cool. Uh, neat thing that Google did, um, you know, to mark the um, the end game uh, coming out today. I am so pumped to see this movie. I am very, very excited. And um, yeah, it's going to be fantastic. And already it's it's shattering box office records. And, and really today is the official opening. So 
Avengers Endgame doing nothing but winning. And get ready for, by the way, next week, they'll announce how much money it made, and it will easily be the biggest movie of all time. Uh, I mean, you you can just you can just see you can feel that coming. So, man, let's talk about the Boy Scouts of America. Jeez, my goodness, my goodness. So, there have been more than twelve thousand Boy Scout members that were victims of sexual abuse. This story is horrific. It's incredible. It's so so bad. And for an organization that is, you know, has has always had a pretty good reputation, um, you know, I was a Boy Scout, uh, I was an Eagle Scout, um, you know, uh, and and just it's just horrifying to see that there are this many um, uh, abuses, you know, going on inside the Boy Scouts. God, come on, man! So more than seventy eight hundred individuals nationwide allegedly abused twelve thousand two hundred fifty four victims, according to court testimony. Um, my goodness, my goodness, that is all kinds of losing. And, um, you know, the boy scouts were famous for basically saying, Hey, we're going to let in the girl scouts. Uh, and then the girl scouts, you know, I did a a show about, I guess maybe about a year ago where we talked about sort of the battle between the, um, in, in winning and losing, we talked about the battle between the boy scouts and the girl scouts and, and that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, that is all kinds of losing and it's just, it's just a terrible, terrible thing that's happening. And, um, man, and, and the, the really terrible part is the fact that the quotes in these say is that this is information that the Boy Scouts of America had for several years and they're, they've covered it up. Right. I mean, this could be the literal end of the Boy Scouts of America right here. Uh, you know, just, you know, a, a bunch of bad apples. It's like, what is, what is going on here? It's just, it's it's terrible. It's the same kind of thing like when you see the sexual abuse going on in the Catholic Church, you know, and, and, and you see the people covering it up and everything. It's just it's just man, it's a it's just a reminder that that uh that these things are out there. But for the Boy Scouts of America as an organization, marketing wise, uh all kinds of losing, all kinds of crisis communications going on. And my advice to the Boy Scouts of America would be, you know, let's tell the truth. Let's 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 figure out, you know, the the way through this crisis is you figure out how deep it goes. You and you figure out, how, you know, how to get those people some help, get them out of the organization, get help for the people that have been abused, you know, that that sort of thing. You, you know, all of those steps. But from a public relations standpoint, you've got to be able to say, you know, Man, what is this? I mean, you've got to be just just incredibly honest about how this was happening and how this escaped your attention. And if there were cover ups, then those people should be absolutely gone, gone, gone. And new people should be brought in um, to try to restore some trust in the organization if the organization can be saved at all. And that's a huge if. So anyway, losing, losing, losing. They got the merit badge for losing this week. Jeez. So uh, the economy is winning. My goodness, is the economy winning? U.S. economy grew at 3.2 percent in the first quarter. Uh, started with a huge, with a pop growing despite a lot of things, including you know a weaker domestic demand. Um, you know, th- th- there's uh, you know uh, the, the government shutdown, all those kind of things. You know, gross G- so gross domestic product, the value of all the goods and services produced in the country, adjusted for inflation and seasonality, rose at 3.2 percent. From January through March, the strongest rate of the first quarter growth in four years. So our economy is just just rolling, rolling, rolling right along, and uh, and that should make everybody pretty happy because um, you know uh, that's uh, that's what we want to see. Uh, all of us that own businesses, we want to see consumer confidence high. We want to see spending high. We want to see you know all all of those things. We want to see those value of those goods being shipped. And we want to see, um, you know, this country's economy doing doing very, very well. Uh, so winning, all kinds of winning. Uh, you know, Joe Biden um, entered the very crowded uh, presidential race for 2020. And, uh, and he did so with sort of a weird slogan that everybody's been making fun of and stuff. I don't really talk politics on the show, but we are going to, we talk, too talk messaging and tone and this whole show right here is about tone. And, and basically Biden said, America is coming back. 
is his going to be his slogan, right? And here's what he says. So he said, America's coming back like it used to be. Ethical, straight, telling the truth, supporting our allies. All those good things. <laughs> and he got all kinds of problems for saying the words straight, you know, and that kind of thing. You know, people mocked him for saying that America is quote unquote straight and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a tough message coming from a politician, right? Politicians just lie from birth, man. And 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 I just don't believe a word of that. I got to say that just sounds like a lot of BS, but you know, uh, I certainly latching on to you know Donald Trump's famous slogan, "Make America Great Again," um, you know, uh, and and then to kind of create a slogan and says America's coming back, America, you know, is, you know, and trying to really make it like Trump's slogan. That's not a way to distance yourself from you know from a very popular you know sitting president, and um, yeah. It's a bad slogan. That's a that's a bad slogan, and and uh, you know, what can I, what, can, what can you say without getting too uh, too political? I just think the slogan's really dumb. Starbucks is under some fire. They're losing a little bit this week because they are going to install needle disposal boxes in bathrooms nationwide. Um, this is on today today dot com from yesterday. As the opioid crisis continues to affect millions of Americans, Starbucks says it will move forward with plans to install more needle disposal boxes in select store bathrooms. Uh, So apparently there are people uh, using needles uh, and leaving them in the, I guess, trash of Starbucks at at a rate that necessitates this, um, you know, needing of uh, boxes for needle disposal. No other uh, fast food restaurants do that, uh, have a need for that. So you got to kind of wonder, um, you know, you know, Star- Starbucks is known for doing really stupid things in communications. I mean, I have to say that across my career, if there's a story that's where there's going to be something extremely stupid that's been said or done, it's very, very likely that Starbucks is behind it. If, if you're anybody from Starbucks is listening, your communications is terrible. Your communication staff is terrible, right? I mean, you, you folks step in it more than any company with the exception of Chipotle, you know, that I can, or United Airlines that I could possibly mention. They uh, got roasted for this move, obviously, and in, in basically saying modern day opium dens, uh, you know, Starbucks encouraging, you know, hey, they're, you know, it, it, you know, it's just, it's just weird. It's the, the whole thing is weird. It's bad press for you. It makes people not want to go into Starbucks, although Starbucks are pretty crowded, but I don't know. I just, I call it all kinds of losing. Cause it's just, uh, it's something that, that, that they did, you know, probably that a lawyer told them to do. They had to settle a case and, and that kind of thing. And instead of doing it kind of quietly and figuring out how to do it in a couple of locations, they decided to make it a, a you know, a Seattle wide thing and a nationwide thing. And, And then that's where they got into trouble. Terrible, as Charles Barkley would say. You know, Warren Buffett um, sees most newspapers as, uh, quote unquote, toast after the ad decline. You know, and Warren Buffett's the man behind a print empire that includes uh, the Buffalo News and the Omaha World Herald. And he doesn't think newspapers can be saved. He says uh, the decline of advertising gradually turned the newspaper industry from monopoly to franchise to competitive. Um, And now most newspapers are, quote unquote, toast. So the world has changed, you know, too much and now newspapers aren't going to make it. Um, Interesting. I mean, you know, Craigslist is is listed in in here. There's a, a couple stories on Bloomberg Finance Yahoo has has a couple of stories on it. You know, it reminds me, I'm going to do a story, uh, uh, a show next week on sort of the state of the media uh, today and just talk about what's going on. Um, Decision just released that released their uh, state of the media report. And it reminded me that it probably is a good time to um, talk about the various media companies that are out there, how the landscape has changed, who owns who these days and sort of where, where our news kind of comes from. Um, you know, and some, and a lot of PR people kind of know, know this, but it's a good, it's a good reminder because it does change. And some, and if your information is from like, you know, 2013, 2014, you're definitely going to want to pay attention to that show because the world has changed quite a bit and we want to stay, uh, stay on top of that stuff. And finally, 
Oh, man. Amazon sellers are now paying uh, under the table, Amazon, up to $10,000 a month to sort of trick their way to the top. There is an emerging black market where Amazon sellers are, you know, offered pricey ways to cheat the marketplace and mislead customers, according to some documents obtained by BuzzFeed News. Uh, so for millions of third-party sellers on Amazon's marketplace, uh, you know, you, you want to rank high in the in the Amazon search results, collect positive product reviews, and kind of keep up with Amazon when it's releasing its own versions of, of your successful products, right? That kind of thing. So now you're seeing a lucrative black market where agents are peddling black hat services, which are like they're bribing Amazon employees that give marketplace sellers an advantage over their rivals. So uh, the most prominent black hat companies for U.S. Amazon sellers offer ways to manipulate Amazon's ranking system um, to protect products from disciplinary actions and sort of crush their competitors. Um, You know, these black hat companies bribe corporate Amazon employees to leak information from the company's wiki pages and business reports, which they resell to marketplace sellers for steep prices. One black hat company charged as much as $10,000 a month to help Amazon sellers appear at the top of search results. Yikes. Oh, man. So this is all kinds of losing, right? All kinds of losing because you, um, you know, now that we buy so many things, you know, through Amazon, that really sort of becomes the search engine, right? And if the search engine is manipulated by uh, employees taking money under the table and that sort of thing, then people are going to stop to start or stop trusting it. And then what happens when people stop trusting, you know, the ratings that are coming in and the product reviews um, and, 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 th- and that sort of thing. Trust is a, is a big commodity. We talk about it a lot on the show and once you lose it, it's going to be real hard to get back. So it'll be interesting to see how Amazon responds to this uh, Buzzfeed uh, expose um, that has come out very fascinating and that's who's winning and losing this week folks right now you are tuned to made the best brand win on intertalk radio the undisputed leader in music biz talk come on back we're gonna dig into and i'm gonna give you some tips for achieving your own great tone see you in a few I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on InterTalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John G.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, everybody, it is Friday, and you are tuned to Made the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio. 
The Undisputed Leader in Music Biz Talk. I am Scott, your host. We just did a bunch of winning and losing. We got Hans hanging out in the uh, Intertalk capsule down there and seeing what's going on. So, Hans, what did you like from winning and losing this week? Um, I liked listening to just, uh, well, I didn't like it, but I, I, I liked hearing about the, uh, but I think it was Biden's um, slogan. <laughs> yeah, geez. It was terrible. It, it, it didn't seem like he was, um, I think, I feel like he was trying to, to imitate the president in such a way, but he, I didn't, think so. he didn't pull pull far enough away, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's ter- it's that's a, that's a terrible slogan, you know, and America's, you know, coming back and then and then the data doesn't support it, right? You know, it's like it, it, the 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 economy is I I just mentioned, you know, it's on an all-time tear, right? The stock market's closed with like all-time highs. It's like so we're going to bring America back and people are like back to when it sucked. You're I mean, like, you yeah, know, it's it, doing good. It's yeah, doing good. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It only works if there's a problem. That's a, that's a, that's the problem with that slogan too. So true, man. So true. Lots of stuff uh, happening. Well, cool, folks. Well, you guys are listening to an episode. Uh, we are just been talking about tone this whole episode, right? Talking about the importance of your marketing tone. And I'm going to give you some tips of my very own that to achieve uh, really great tone. Um, you know, it sounds like I'm getting ready to talk about your guitar and like what you should set all your knobs for and that kind of thing. But and in, in a way, maybe I am, but uh, metaphorically. But my first tip is that you need to know your, you need to start off and know your brand's emotional core before you can make a decision and say our brand is going to be sympathetic or snarky or nostalgic or funny or friendly or conversational or cheerful or caring before you make a decision that says we're going to be any of these things you have to know who you are at the core of your brand right and so it has to connect to something it has to connect to that brand's emotional core you know when i do message i do messaging sessions for companies all the time and one of the things that we and, and one of the things is important that we include on the message map document is we include that emotional brand core where are we anchoring this brand? Are we anchoring it in love? Are we anchoring it in trust? Are we anchoring it in fear? Are we going to anchor in, you know, what, where are we going to build our house, you know, sort of thing. And then, so once you know that, then you can start to figure out what your tonality is going to be. Like, uh, you know, for example, one of my clients, you know, Band Lab Technologies, they have several different brands under the under the flag, and each one of those brands has a different brand personality, right? The Tysco brand, you know, is a little more snarky and a little more, um, you know, I don't know, edgy. Tysco's always been known for producing kind of weird musical instruments, to be quite honest. And um, and so Band Lab's, you know, sort of continuing that with things that are kind of unexpected, you know, bold colors. You know, it has its own sort of personality. You know, the Heritage Guitars brand, which Band Lab represents, you know, is, is uh, you know, steeped in tradition, is steeped in, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, trust, you know, and and that sort of you know traditional approach, you know, whereas you look at the Harmony Guitars brand, you know, that's a that's a different brand personality as well, you know, and and so and and you can go through each one of these, but my point is, you need to know your brand's emotional core, right? And so because that's really going to set everything up for success. If I when I go to see a, a, a prospective client and I say, what's the what's the emotional brand core here, and people don't have an answer then it's real hard to do the rest of this. You know, it's like, um, it's like kind of filling in your name at the beginning of a paper. It's like, uh, you know, if, if we don't have your name, but then we can't really move forward or if we didn't move forward, it's not it, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's basic, basic number one stuff at the top of the form that needs to be figured out and done. It's gotta be done. It's gotta be done. There's no, there's no two ways about it. There's no way to just, um, happen into a brand personality if you don't really haven't really spent time digging into um what a brand's emotional core is like i said i offer strategic messaging sessions to clients as a one-time project or an ongoing as part of a kind of package deal where we um or where we really spend time and, and dig into that brand messaging um and then once it's written down it exists and we can sort of start to move forward um that brings me to my second tip create written instructions that describe your brand's tone okay if you're going to be the snarky brand 
then you better have a document that says, we are snarky. We take a snarky tact on things. And here's some examples of how we would take things and to, to talk right and be snarky. Or if we're going to be, you know, um, sympathetic, then it's like, you know, then this is how we're going to write with a sympathetic tone. This is the kind of language that we're going to use. This is an example of how to do that. And, you know, writers, we can shift tone, um, you know, like like crazy, just like stepping on a guitar pedal. I mean, I shift tone uh, on almost every client that I work for because I'm it's not me talking. It's them talking. And I'm just trying to, you know, deliver that and make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're delivering on our, uh, you know, brand platform, so to speak. So it's really, really important though, to have those written instructions, because if you bring in like a, a professional writer and you say, okay, well, we want to, we, we want a brochure and you haven't given them any description of what the brand's tone is. Well, who the hell knows what you're going to get back? I mean, you don't know what you're going to get back. You're probably, you're not going to get something correct back, not just by accident. It just doesn't happen that way. So it's really, really important that you, that, that, you know, that we write it down and that we describe and we have a really good description of the brand's tone. Like, um, you know, uh, if you've ever been fortunate enough to work with a Disney company, they have a huge binder that says visually, this is how you handle all of our visual trademarks. And um, when you're writing things on our behalf, this is how we say things. This is the exact language we use to say things. This is the personality that we use when we're when when we're talking. Although, since you're not really talking on our behalf, don't get clever and try to insert personality. You know, for for one of Disney's brands, they're not going to like it, right? If you if they need something written with the personality of one of their brands, they'll do it. You know, and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, and you also have to know that too. You have to make sure you get those rules clear. As to um, what you can and can't do when you're working with, uh, especially with the, working with a larger brand that has, you know, those kind of things uh, written down. So write it down. That's what I would say. Uh, tip number three. You know, when you are reviewing communications of any kind, make sure you're checking for tone. Make sure you are checking everything for tone. The, like the the what happened email that we got from Farmer Boys that we talked about that is just so bad. It's so bad. And it's really off tone. And, and and I went and looked at some of the rest of their other things. And I was like, do they have this really weepy, needy, sad, scarecrow, bullcrap tone in all the other things that they've sent me? And they don't. They don't. This is a one-off. And and somebody got creative, uh, you know, in quotes. And somebody got creative. And somebody did a weird tone thing that got them mentioned on the show in a really negative way. Right. And everybody who received that, I guarantee you, they either deleted it or they were just creeped out by it. You know, so when it's your job to review communications, you're not just looking to see if the periods are in the right place, the commas in the right place. You're checking to make sure that the the tone of language that is used is the proper tone. You know, when you're when you're writing a speech for your CEO, that's a different tone than when you're running a CEO for a mid-level manager, you know, it absolutely is. It, it absolutely is, you know, and so you've got to take that in, into consideration. And then if both of them are, you know, basically, uh, you know, submitting to the brand, you know, then you also have a third type of tone. You want to make sure that, that everybody's on tone with the brand. If they're doing those kind of speaking ops, you know, sometimes individuals in the company, you know, you have to, you just have to make a decision. And say, are we going to, you know, are we going to defer to their tone because we think it's going to be effective with this audience, that kind of thing? Or are we going to have them, you know, stay in our tone with the stay in the brand's tone and that kind of thing? And obviously, both those things can be happening at once, too. So, um, like I said, just make sure that you are reviewing that because, you know, there's a lot more to communications. If you get an email that's that's scheduled to go out and you're supposed to review it. A lot of people are, you know, just checking to say, "Oh yeah, great. Does the offer button work at the end?" and and those kind of things. But in communications, we're looking and saying and and asking this question, when the user receives this email with the subject header of what happened, what is their reaction? What is their reaction? Is this the way that we talk to them usually? 
And if it's not, huge red flag. Huge, huge, huge red flag right there. You know, if this isn't, if you're reviewing the last 10 emails and none of them are the needy, the needy person tone, and all of a sudden you've got one needy person email, then you're like, I'm sorry, but who snuck in and wrote this one? You know, it, it's, uh, it's really, really important. Like I said, in branding, the reason that branding is such a bear for companies out there is that everything counts. Everything counts. You're never done. You're never off. The switch never never goes to off. As long as you're in business, every single thing that you do, every single interaction by every single employee, every single email that goes out, every single text message that goes out, every single everything that goes out goes to the brand, right? That's why it takes a team of people to be watching the brand because it's just, it's a very, very, very hard job. When you sign up and say, I'm going to be watching the brand of this company, get ready. You know, you, you are on call 24 seven to make sure nothing stupid happens, you know, and there's a lot of stupid in the world as we, if you don't believe me, just rewind and go check out the last segment and, and just go down all the losing people, you know, and just say, man, that's a lot of mistakes right there. That's what I'm talking about. So Tip number four, you know, the business is going to change and it's going to evolve. When that happens, the tone might move as well. When we, if we're a startup, we might have a certain tone of voice that is playful, you know, or it's more, you know, you know, snarky or, or funny or humorous or those kind of things. But as we kind of get older, you know, maybe we are more casual or maybe we're more edgy or maybe we're more frank. You know, I mean, you know, you know, the business evolves. It's not just, uh, hey, we've got this written on a, a document, and so now we're checking for everything for this, and we're and we're making sure, right? It's a conversation, it's a relationship. So it's more it's more complicated than that, and the tone will, might move as well. So be sure that you are keeping up. You know, have an annual review where you're discussing brand messaging and you're discussing tone. And you're writing down things and say, are we still a company that has a playful tone with everything that we're doing? Or or have we made some, is this really happens in acquisitions. Let's say you, you suddenly you acquire a couple of other companies, you know, and, and believe me, you acquire their brand tone as well. It's like, well, maybe this division isn't so playful anymore because we hired some, we brought in some really serious companies and maybe we're really much more formal and frank now and, and, and that kind of thing in this division of our business because we've grown and we've evolved. Make sure you have the rules in front of you. And if you're the person, if you're the, if I'm speaking to the VP of marketing and the, or the chief marketing officer, it's your job to write the rules and make sure everybody has them. You know, uh, it's really, really important that you're meeting with people and you're discussing things like tone, especially your content creators out there. You know, I talk to bloggers sometimes and they say, oh, the company doesn't give me any direction. They just let me do whatever I want. Eh, wrong answer. I mean, maybe they get it right, but they probably got it wrong. And there's probably somebody else out there writing something else that is not going to be on message with what you're writing. Right. And that is unprofessional. That is unprofessional. Don't do that. Make sure you're having conversations with all the people who are creating content on behalf of the brand and make sure that you have them on the same playbook, you know, as, uh, you know, as yourself or anybody else that's, that's, uh, that's doing that. It's really hard to do. I mean, I have to say it's easy to say it's easy to make it into a tip and that kind of thing. But there is a there are volumes of work that goes in into um, into be doing to doing what we're talking about there. You know, so, so far we know we've got the brand's emotional core. We're writing down those instructions that describe the brand's tone. We're uh, reviewing everything and we're, we're specifically checking for tone. We're making sure that we've got a good grasp of tone. And then as the business is changing and evolving, uh, we're recognizing that the tone of voice might change as well. And we're making sure that we're keeping up with that and we're updating our written documents, you know, pursuant to that. Important. Number five is, you know, you can have fun with tone. You really can. I mean, if you've made a conscious decision to, um, you know, write a certain way and and to to have a certain brand personality, let's say you have a kind of a, you know, 
it must be a lot of fun working on Wendy's social media accounts because they make fun of everything their competitors do. They are super, they're, they're funny. They're witty. They're very edgy. Their, their feed is very, very good. And, and, and not just in the big stuff, either the stuff that there is outgoing, but in their response to people that, um, it, you know, sometimes people will have fun with the brand that uh, Wendy's is not a, a, you know, a life changing brand. I mean, you're, you're buying a chicken sandwich, you know, you know, you know, you're buying, you're buying a hamburger. So it's like, they watch for people that are invoking their name and then they, they do things to kind of play along with them. Just people say, Oh, Wendy's, you know, how many of these hamburgers can I stuff in my mouth? You know, and the wind and Wendy's will come back and be like, uh, I don't know. We, we don't have a full body shot of you. So we don't really don't know really, you know, what, what you, you know, send us a full body shot and they'll have like a whole, you know, exchange with somebody back and forth with the brand that comes from knowing, you know, who you are, right? If you're the kind of brand that is going to be kind of playful and snarky and, and you're going to make that decision, then, then yeah, you can absolutely, you know, you can absolutely have a lot of fun with tone. I think that you, you can, you know, for a lot of the B2B blogs that I write, you know, I write in a tone that is kind of informative, but also it's kind of funny, right? Because, uh, and, and some people say, oh, well, you know, Scott, that may not be professional. I'm like, you know what? In this day and age, you're competing for attention. If you're not funny and you're not informative, then you're just you're just boring and you're going to be forgotten. The next time uh, the video comes up of an owl stuck in a tree stump, you know you're done. People are watching them how they got the owl out. You know that's what's going to happen. So those are my tips for achieving your best tone. So what have we learned today, class? We've learned that um, tone is a really big deal, and sometimes brands don't know it, haven't thought about it, or don't have it. Because they've spent a bunch, way too much time thinking about the logo and going, hey, we've got our brand all taken care of, uh, you know, or like Major League Baseball, uh, you know, hey, we've got uh, the, the logo taken care of. And it really doesn't matter if we use the word you in colors, even though we're America's pastime. You know, it, it's not OK to do that. Tone is about how we say things, how much attitude you have. And that's the key in attracting more people to you. So spend time on it. Get it right. And that's it for me, folks. This has been Scott Robertson, host of May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader on Music Biz Talk. Come on back next week for a fresh show. I'm going to see Avengers Endgame. See ya. Bye. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie's Groove.com. Ready to get your groove on?